Johnny, how are you feeling about this Tough Mudder training? Well, as you know, we had a little, well, I had a little accident this morning. Yeah, well, no, no we here. <laughs> well, I noticed that as I was holding my face and the blood shooting out, you were nowhere to be involved. I actually, I, to be fair, I handed you my sweat towel. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. That was very friendly of me. <laughs> yeah, and you're usually very protective of your sweat towel. So I should, we should tell the audience what happened this morning so that they can have a laugh at my expense. I certainly have had plenty of them today. Um, so we were at the gym training for the Tough Mudder. And as if you guys are, as we're recording this, I believe we're two weeks out. Yeah. And there's about 20 of us, including our guest, Chris, who was on the show, our trainer. Yeah. He's very important to this story because he was with us this morning. And two weeks out, and Chris wants to make sure that the functional training of the obstacles that we're going to be doing is in our in our training program. And so we were doing the old peg board wall where the pegs go in the wall and you're climbing up and you got to climb down them. And some of you all know what I'm talking about. And they can be pretty dangerous, but I wasn't really thinking about that because I had a. I had a mission of accomplishing this thing today because it the has, wall has taken us down a few times up until this point. And I will say, you know, those of you who know the pegboard wall know that sometimes you beat the wall and sometimes the wall beats you. And today, well, it's uh, beaten us every time. Say, what, what is this sometimes? <laughs> I, I'm still waiting for my sometimes. I it beat has the wall. beaten us every time. And then today, it put the kick in the balls to the beating of me. As, actually, it was a, a kick in the teeth. In the teeth. So as I'm going up, it, the, one of the pegs had slipped out. And I will go ahead and say that this has already happened twice earlier today that I didn't think anything of it. I got away with just a, a bruise. that I, and I commented to start that you should be wearing a helmet yeah. for this activity. <laughs> Neither you and Chris responded. No, no. And so... Going up. Try number three. Yes. Try number three. The peg slipped out and bashed me straight in the mouth. And I have a bit of one. I have a tooth that's a little protruding. You might be able to use. You could see it in pictures. And the the peg just happened to directly smack that tooth and the lip and bite on the lip that is there. So I fall to the ground. I obviously realized there was something in my mouth, so it must be spit out. And that's when you saw my my tooth, tooth. go flying across the gym. Yeah. It was a lovely morning. And then I handed you my sweat towel, like yeah. a, an amazing friend. Yes, as, as you did. And a lot of blood was coming out because my lip had busted open. And uh, I'm a little bit in shock at the moment because I don't, there's I a lot going on. I just want to point on. something out for the audience. You know, we talk a lot on the show about if you are getting the same results and expecting something different, you might want to try to change what you're doing yeah. so that you're not getting the same results. Yeah. This little story here illustrates <laughs> that we are not immune to the teachings of the show. We struggle with these things as well. well that is for sure. And the wall has bested us. Yes. We got a little times. angry. It was the middle of the training and your tooth took the blunt. It's literally. And... You know, and I was thinking as I'm sitting in the dentist chair today, uh, right after the gym, I was, I was appreciative that it couldn't have happened at a better time and place because Chris, our trainer, his husband, just happens to be a dentist. Yeah, he's got a nice, <laughs> he's got a nice little business going there. Yeah, work you out in the, the gym, gym bust lose you your teeth, go see Shit. my husband. Yeah, <laughs> nice little upsell he's got working. So yeah, I was able to get a, a cap put on. So for those of you watching this on YouTube, if yeah. Johnny looks a little funny on camera, yeah. you don't need to adjust your screen. It is due to the tooth incident. And if my if my speech is a little bit more slurred than usual, it's certainly not from drinking today. <laughs> yeah, please send him. A an email johnny at the art of charm dot com about his voice and your issues with it. He enjoys those especially. Yes. Welcome back to our month of navigating relationships. In the first part of our toolbox episode last week, we looked at dealing with uncertainty in relationships in general. Then we took a look at navigating your leadership role at work and the four tasks that you need to start doing from day one. And of course, we wrapped the episode up with navigating new relationships. And the question we often get, how do I find new friends after I move to a new city? Now, in this episode, we're going to look at navigating romance. 
That's right, going into a committed relationship, maybe even moving in together. How do you know when to do that? We're also gonna talk about how to have the conversation around money with your partner. One of the leading causes of emotional strife and ultimately the destruction of relationships is your conversation with money. And lastly, how to deal with growing apart in a relationship. I know, Johnny, this is something that we've talked a lot about getting into relationships on the show over the years. Yeah. Dating, obviously, was how we got our start. But navigating relationships, we're going to talk about some situations that I feel we get a ton of questions about. We do, and they're, and they're important. And all relationships have to ask and answer these questions. And it was good for us to, to, to brush up, get a little research in them, and then find out some interesting ways to go about it. And for us to finally have a full discussion about it. Now, one of the questions we get a lot is, how do you know that the person you're seeing should become your girlfriend or boyfriend? How do you take it to the next level? When do you know? And I feel like in today's swipe life, yeah. as Johnny likes to say, there are an endless amount of options and it becomes very difficult. The paradox of choice in our dating lives of how do we know who to settle down with? The second part of this episode, we're actually going to talk about the money discussion in a relationship. Yeah. It's actually one of the leading causes of stress and breakup is money. And how do you have that conversation? How do you come to some common ground with your partner? And then we're gonna end the show with, what do you do when you feel the relationship drifting apart? Yeah. How do you handle that? I know we've talked about breakups, we've talked about starting relationships, but these are important decisions in all of our lives romantically and how we navigate is really important. So let's kick things off first and foremost with this idea of how do you know this person is the one, the one to get serious with? Yeah. And as always, I just want to be truthful and honest ab about this and come from it from a scientific perspective. A lot of people, it's well, it's easy to get a storybook, movie perfect picture of finding the right person or that the right person is out there. We are in Hollywood. We are. <laughs> and we've been spoon fed this idea all of our lives. And you certainly don't need to live in Hollywood to have to to fall into the, in the line with that. It's on to television and books and, and and everywhere we go. But that's just not the reality of the situation. I'm waiting for the movie that's about the couple that met on one of these dating apps. Swipe Life. That movie's got to be around the corner. I'm, I'm sure it is and you know, I'm not going to waste my time. <laughs> but we don't we don't romanticize a lot of the ways that we meet one another. But when it comes to deciding, is this the right person for me? Should I become committed to this person? Well, we're not going to give you a 12 point checklist of no. things to do. And that's not how the show's formatted. But we are going to talk about three questions to ask yourself. Now, this is probably one of the most subjective areas that we're going to cover of the show. Understanding who's the right person for you is going to be largely on your gut. It's not going to be the right person for Johnny. It's not going to be the right person for me. And we want you to keep that in mind as we go through this first section here, because we're not about telling you how to live your life. We want to help you figure out the best way to do that. And to, to bring it back to what we put together last week is that there a lot of times there's no right or wrong decisions. And so then it goes to make you making the decision right. So you putting all your efforts and your commitment and your energy into making whatever you choose the right one. And because it's a relationship, you wanna make sure that the other person is willing to do that same work or we're gonna have a, a very lopsided giving and taking in the relationship. And then on top of that, it's in, in folklore for both men and women that that idea, I mean, even girls are told if from an early age, you're gonna have to kiss a lot of frogs so you find Prince Charming. Guys know that they're gonna have to play the field to find person who's right for them. And for, I see what the, it's usually the young guys and gals who write in asking, how do I know I found the right person? And you don't. It's about the work that you're willing to put in and the work that the other person is willing to put in. And that is really our first question to ask yourself. As we start seeing someone, even when we're not completely committed, 
we have these rose colored glasses on. We talk a lot about the honeymoon phase yeah. where the other person is amazing. The other person's perfect for you. You overlook every flaw. You may not even notice the flaws. In fact, you're just so <laughs> happy and the chemistry is there, right? We talked about chemistry on an episode of the Evan Marquettes and how it can be deceptive. Yes. When it comes to choosing the right person. Well, we can, there's chemistry, there's biases that you're bringing in. Um, your previous experiences of the people you've dated are going to be co coloring these biases. So there's a lot going on. So of course you're going to overlook some things that perhaps six months, a year and five years could drive you nuts. <laughs> and the thing is, is when the rose color glasses start to fade, the chemistry starts to wear off a little bit. You come out of the, the fog. The question that we want to start with is, is this going to work for you if the person doesn't change or if you don't change? Right. And I, I think this is an important question because a lot of us find ourselves starting relationships with people that we see that we can fix. Mm -hmm. I don't like everything about this person, but with enough time with me, I'm going to fix them. I'm going to make them right. I'm going to show them all the lessons I learned, how to do things the right way. I, th I think another thing that goes on with that is we can only, it's difficult to judge other people because we don't live their experiences and, and, and everything that they have to go through. We can only live ours and we tend to project that on other people, especially people we like, because we see things in them that might not even be there that will make up about that person in order for us to feel good about being attracted to them. For instance, if I'm very much into self-development, it's easy for me to, why wouldn't everyone be into self-development? Why wouldn't you want to be a better person? Why wouldn't you want to work on yourself? And if you tend to do a lot of work on yourself, you expect other people to do those things. And if you bring up that conversation, they can look at you once again as, as you're the one that's crazy. Right. What's your problem? Why are you picking on me? Yeah. Why are you judging me? You liked me when we met. Well, what's wrong with me now? I didn't change. You're the one that's changing. You're the one that's reading the changing books. So the first <laughs> bucket of cold water is the question, <laughs> is this going to work for you? Even if the other person doesn't change. And if you don't change. Stop trying to change people. Stop going into relationships thinking that you can be the repairman. It's not a good look. It does not work out in that way. And it's, it's tempting in the beginning to think that these issues will just sort themselves out. Like give it enough time. Chances are actually they're not going to sort themselves out. No. The, the issues that present themselves in the beginning tend to stay there. And as much as we've talked about personal development and change, change is hard for humans. Th that is a very hopeful, idealistic way of going into it, right? It, things will work themselves out. If they see me operating in a certain manner, they'll they'll figure it out. I'm going to show them the way. How many times can you roll into a relationship in that manner and have it blow up in your face before you start <laughs> going into it like with a very uh, pessimistic idea of the relationship, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, we're not preaching, you know, remove all optimism. But again, as we heard... Evan Marquette saying his episode around dating is that dating is a full contact sport and yeah. the odds are stacked against you. Meaning not everyone is the one. There aren't very many matches for you. That's why you got to get out there. And, and as Johnny says, kiss a lot of frogs. And I, I think people have to be, uh, well, they have to look at experience and uh, that you're going to go through a, lot, a few partners. You're going to meet a lot of people as don't look at it as a bad thing. Learn, look at it as growth and learning about what you don't want in a relationship. That's very important. How are you able to pick good people for yourself if you don't know one way or another what's going to work for you? It, we've all done this. Of course. You know, I've gone into relationships myself knowing that there's this issue, but I'm like, oh man, this chemistry is amazing. This, this, yeah, why well, throw this yeah, away? I, and... To be honest, there's been situations where I've been pushed into the relationship mm -hmm. because I wasn't sure. I saw the issues, but they kept pushing. I was like, yeah, let's keep it going. Why not? It's going to sort itself out. Wrong, AJ. It's not sorting itself out. So understanding that if you think and expect change is going to make things better when you're starting a relationship with someone, that is a faulty idea. The other important question to ask yourself 
is whether you have a complete picture of the other person. Again, the honeymoon phase is a lot of physicality, is a lot of chemistry, is probably not a lot of meeting friends, yeah. seeing their real interests, figuring out what they do for fun. A lot of this stuff that we see in the beginning stages of seeing someone is just that, their best foot forward. Mm -hmm. Have you had enough time experience with this person to see the full picture? Or are you making a judgment and rushing into committed relationship with just a single snapshot of this person? Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's going to be your best representation of them because you need to rationalize to yourself why you're wasting your time with this person. <laughs> so of course you're going to build them up into this am amazing, <laughs> I don't like just character that, 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 you know, they're, they're going to have faults. I remember when Amy and I met in Vegas, I met at a pool party. Yeah. And I was obviously in a pool. My hair was down. I was not wearing glasses. I was wearing sunglasses. Yeah. And then I got back to the room. I was packing to head back to LA. And I really had spent the entire weekend, Labor Day weekend, in Las Vegas. So at this point, most of my clothes were dirty. I had worn them. So I had one outfit left that I had worn to the club that was probably the cleanest. So I just threw that on. I wasn't expecting to meet anyone. I had planned to come back to LA. So I was just shooting home. So Amy sees me in the pool, hair down, very relaxed, very mild mannered. And then <laughs> I get out of the shower and I'm, I'm cleaned up and ready to drive home. And I'm wearing my club attire. And right. she's just like, who's this guy? Who? What? This is not the guy I met in the pool. Right. Saw a different side of me. Think about that. How many experiences have you had with this person to really see the full picture? Well, if you only really hung out at yours or hung out at theirs or just gone to that one spot where you guys have met, you don't have a full picture of this person and you may be rushing into something. Yeah. And well, the picture that you paint of these of, of your significant other and people that you're interested in. You mentioned that the, there's the chemistry, there's all this stuff going on, biases, uh, the rationalizing of, cause you have time at stake here and, a, and commitment at stake. And you know, people make these calls about people and even when they see signs that the picture that they painted is not correct, They'll rationalize away even those th things that are blatant or they'll act as if they didn't happen. And I can give one, which is because of my haircut, a lot of people tend to think that I'm British. You've, you've been with me enough to hear this. And of course, I do not have anything of a British accent. And pe when people find out, well, I'll, they'll say something about being from London or England. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm not... I'm not from Pittsburgh. There. I'm from Pittsburgh. And they're like, that's, that's funny. Great um, American accent. You got there, yeah, buddy. Yeah. You have a, you have a, you have a British accent. Like you're not fooling anybody. And, and it's hilarious to me because first of all, I'm not, I don't have a British accent. I flat out told them that I am not from Britain and that I don't have a British accent, but because they've already decided that I am, they'll ignore all of that. And they'll hear things that are not there. It's a yeah. and, and sometimes they'll, seen it. they'll project onto you that it's a fake accent. You're um, it's a fake American accent. Yeah, you're using. I'm doing a <laughs> couple more drinks. Your real British accent's going to show it's and, and we do this in these relationships as well. And we'll, we'll ignore and there is, we'll, we'll see behaviors and actions that we don't approve of that we would never tolerate from anyone close to us. But yet with this person, oh, well, you know, we, and we got a giant web of rationalizations and that we made. It tends to happen with people that we find likable, with people that we are attracted to. This is scientifically proven. When you actually like someone and you are interested in someone, you highlight mm -hmm their strengths and you downplay their weaknesses. Yep. That's all you can see is the positive. So obviously when we're talking about starting a relationship with someone, being committed with someone, we want to give it enough time and space and see them in different environments, maybe meet their friends, meet more of their coworkers and get a better picture of who they are as a person and what is the life that they live. Now, for some of us, this last question is going to probably hit the hardest. Are you willing to put in the work? Because 
relationships are different than dating. When you're dating, you're a free agent. You are not responsible to anyone. But when you are in a relationship, and we're not just going on a string of dates, well, now we gotta discuss and solve problems together. We gotta put our heads together. We gotta work together. And to go along with this, this was probably one of, getting into a relationship for the first time as a young man, one of the things that I had to learn was that I couldn't think as I anymore, and I had to think as we. And I learned that if I didn't think as we, then I was in the doghouse. And, and that changes how you're going to look at it. That changes how, how much time you're going to get to give to a, get to a destination because now you're dealing with a significant other who may have uh, has to, uh, to more time to get ready than you. Well, yeah, uh, the running joke mm-hmm. is when do you see your friends? When I'm single. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and, but even something as what's for dinner or what time are you getting there? Or uh, we now changes how you would answer that question normally as I. Hey, Amy's listening. We is definitely <laughs> the case. An effort to make the other person a priority is what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. Right? The I, single AJ, running around town is not the same as AJ in a relationship. There are other people to consider. And, and some of us, especially our younger listeners, may have never actually experienced that. So yeah. that can be jolting. Are you prepared and willing to make that time and space for them? Yeah. I, that's, that's, I know being an entrepreneur and running the business over the last 12 years that there have been moments in my life where I probably shouldn't have been in a relationship. I did not have the time and space for that person. Thankfully, they stuck with me. But you got to ask yourself, I'm moving into a committed relationship. Do I have the time and space for this person? Will I be able to make it for them? And there's something to say about being honest about that up front of here is what I have to contribute to a relationship at this time. So if you want to continue seeing me as we move forward, you can expect this. But if you, you in a relationship demand more then we're going to need to have a conversation because that is that we have to see if we can find a compromise there. And that's important. Now, this one is amazing to me when we think about, is this someone you can work with? And when we talk about working together, it means, do you have good communication? Mm -hmm. If you can't express your needs and wants, or the other person can't express their needs or wants, that's going to be a relationship that has a lot of turmoil. And we're not just talking needs and wants in the bedroom. We're talking needs and wants in a relationship. As in, do you bring to the table and know what comforts you and and what allows you to feel safe in a relationship? And can you communicate it? Um, So what goes on with this, this, this discussion? This is how you're going to be working through problems. And you have to understand that most problems are not foreseen. They come up right then and you realize, oh, this is a problem. And if you notice now that it's a problem, the reason you do is because either someone's about to or someone's already gotten hurt. Exactly. Now, you have to work through the pain that's been caused or that could have been caused, and we have emotions involved. Those emotions don't get pushed aside because you understand what's happening. And now it's, we just, sh- we'll just, we'll shut the emotions off. We'll go to our logic brain. Yeah, we'll reason we'll work, this out. We'll reason this out and we'll move forward. Yeah, a couple of pie charts, no problem. It's called emotional theater for a reason. These things have to play out. And if you don't allow them to play out, the other person can feel not heard or pushed forward unwilling or unready to get to a certain point and now they're going to hold resentment against you and if you continue to do that that will compound over time right so how how do they communicate under stress and there are a lot of ways you can see this when you're dating right if the valet doesn't have your car if the food is cold if the bartender cuts you off right and the person you're out with if they react in a way where they're not in control of their emotions guess what's going to be brought into the relationship? So when we talk about these questions that we want you to ask yourself 
as we said, it's not this checklist, but really think long and hard about, is this going to work for me if the other person doesn't change or I don't change? What's interesting, about as you date somebody, you start to learn how their emotions flow and you have to learn that you have to let them play out for on your side as well as the other person's. And if you find the, the, how they play it out as annoying, it's, it's only going to get worse because you have to play this, this out every time that there's a fight and it can be, it can be, it could be so annoying and off putting that, it, that just allowing them to work through this will upset you. And now we have two people being upset on, on the same issue on both sides. And I want to point out there was a, a situation I was in where anytime that there was a fight, the next day, if I would be texting back the girl, I'd never hear back because she was still upset. And I, it would play out and then about one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon, I'd start getting likes on my Facebook. And, and it was at that like that I, then I could text her and apologize and then she would accept it. And this had to play out like this. Every time there was this a emotional theater, it, I know this, I had a front row seat. It's, it's, I was a season ticket holder. This stupid, and it would play, and it would it would anger me so bad. And I would even write like, "Do we have to play this out this time? Can we just move on? Do we?" And, and but it, for the other person has to work through those, those emotions, and or they're not going to be ready. And if you can't deal with that emotional theater playing out, this is not a good relationship for you. To yeah, be and that that really is. What we're getting to the meat of this is it's not a checklist. It's it's being honest with your gut and listening to the answers to these three questions. So to recap, question one is, is this going to work for you even if the other person doesn't change or if you don't change? Stop trying to get into a relationship that involves changing someone or being told the only way the relationship is going to work is if you change yep. because change is hard. The second question we're talking about here is, do you have a complete picture of the other person? Or have you really just spent time having that great chemistry or just going to that one spot that you guys both love? Have you experienced enough with this person to really move to that next phase? The last question is, are you willing to put in the work? Because if you aren't willing to put in the work, a relationship is probably not where you should be. Let me ask you, um, what would you say to somebody who would write in and say, how do I get a better picture of my partner? What would you, what would you offer them as, as tactic? So number one, I would say trying to take them into different situations that are situations where you either find yourself a little stressed out mm -hmm. or you find yourself really elated, yep. right? Both ends of the spectrum so that you're getting outside of your comfort zone and you're getting a good sense for how this person interacts. And you're also in your zone of genius, in your zone of joy and seeing how they react. That's a wonderful, in fact, I mean, that's some of the bits that we and, do in at boot camp, right? Yeah, Put, and I, in uh, uncomfortable situations. I, I can't tell you how many times I've met someone, felt that there was a little something there and then went to my favorite spot in my zone of joy. And that person was like, you like to dance, you like this music, I can't believe it. So a lot of times when we're walking around with these rose colored glasses, you know, we're in this, this one little space and, and just having this one experience together. So I like to stretch it on both ends of the spectrum, go outside of my comfort zone and then go where I'm completely elated and see what the interaction is like. And I will add to that to, to not negate when you see behaviors and actions that you, that you don't like from that other person, make a mental note of these things that when you are, as they continue on that you're going to be able to tolerate. Are you able to, what happens if you're not and you bring them up in discussion, does the other person get absolutely defensive and starts uh, throwing at you? I mean, these, once again, are you willing to do the work then? Now, Johnny, we know money is a loaded topic when it comes to relationships. It certainly is. There's various viewpoints on money and relationships. We've heard everything from shared accounts, separate accounts. But at the end of the day, your relationship with money yeah. and your partner's relationship with money is extremely important to understand. Yes. And this was one of the interesting things in doing research for the show that I never really thought about before that it makes all the sense in the world and I apply it to everything else, so why wouldn't it apply here? Which is, what is the story you tell yourself about money? Absolutely. And they can, and there could be, 
Well, there is. There's multiple. There's there could be hundreds of different stories. And if yours doesn't go work well with the other person, this could be a heated piece of contention. And the the science is really interesting. We're going to talk in a second about polarization. I don't want mm-hmm. to get too far ahead, yeah. but the one reason for that is that our relationship with money is really a stand-in for something much more impactful. Our goals, our insecurities and fears, and also what we define as freedom. So when we think about our relationship with money and the story that we tell ourselves about that relationship, do we have a firm grasp on what it truly means? Because some of us aren't even willing to think about our relationship with money. Maybe we've struggled. Maybe it's been a point of contention in our family. But yeah. understanding your relationship with money goes a long way to how to actually have the conversation with your partner. Oh, I can certainly say that over the years, my relationship with money and the story that I've told myself about it has drastically changed. And it's more of a, a point of being more conscientious of now than, I, than when I was certainly younger. And I think that's for everybody. But even so, if that was something that you had been taught well as a child with your allowance and savings and things like that, that is something you're going to carry into young adulthood. Um, and if not, that is something that you're going to have to learn on your own. And if that is something that, that has eluded you or that you had a, a, a relationship where you, you didn't want to have to deal with it, well then how are you going to have, how are you going to talk about that and what, what you think about money with your partner? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've dated women whose parents have basically handled that relationship for them. Wow. They didn't have yeah. any relationship with money because it was just an afterthought, right? Mm-hmm. There was so much abundance for them. They didn't have to worry about it. And then obviously coming from the background that we did where money was scarce mm-hmm. and, and money was a, a, truthfully an existential threat. We, we need food on the table. Yes. That's going to be a drastically different relationship with money. And guess what? This money relationship is a big part of your relationship because if you look at every major life event as a couple, it involves a serious amount of money. Yes. Buying a house, where to send your children, your wedding. Well, we were all major money decisions. A house, I can understand. There's some utility in that. Um, Well, you and I were just laughing about a a wedding that we were talking about of uh, somebody that we know and the out with the price of that and just how ex- it's one of those things. It can be as extravagant as you would like it to be. Whatever you want to spend, there's somebody there willing to help you out with that. Yeah. And if you don't have a, a firm grasp on your partner's relationship with money, they may want an entirely different wedding than you want. They may see it as something that has to be the most extravagant mm-hmm. versus you may view it as, you know what, this is something that I want to enjoy myself, but we don't need to go that overboard. When we don't understand our own relationship with money, then these decisions in a relationship become much more difficult. And unfortunately, a lot of us don't want to talk about money because we know it is stressful. We know it's a point of contention. So we choose to bury our heads in the sand and not have the discussion at all. I know, Johnny, we were laughing uh, on a previous episode about, you know, being in a situation where people ignore the bills entirely. I don't want to see them. I don't want to look at them. Right. (laughs) That's certainly a relationship with money, not a healthy one. You know, that's a relationship. Yeah. And I, I certainly held that in my twenties when I was, you know, when, when most of my job was bartending and being on the road, playing in a band, I didn't want to, my goal was to get as least amount of bills as possible. Right. I had the least amount of responsibility because I never knew what tour was coming up or how long I'd be on the road. So I didn't want anything to hinder those opportunities. But at the same time, you do need some creature comforts as well. And, but I would look to cut corners in any way that I could, as I had gotten older, the creature comforts had evolved and I wanted more of that. But as I matured and, and, and as my goals and focuses changed, my relationship with money has changed as well. Now, this was fascinating in our research for this episode, this concept of polarization. Now, the other reason that money can create so much discord in a relationship is that couples usually polarize around money and not necessarily at the beginning. It's not always that opposites attract, but what research has shown is that eventually when one partner sees the other partner's relationship with money, let's say acting extravagantly, right? Just overspending, being a little 
outlandish with their expenses. The other partner will tend to polarize in the opposite direction, mm-hmm. meaning start saving more, start seeing that as unnecessary expenses. And this polarization happens whether or not you were polarized in the beginning. So you could both come into the relationship having a very similar relationship with money. But as you spend time together, you're going to flip to one of these two poles of the scarcity mindset, abundance mindset, essentially. And in that situation, if you don't have good communication and you're not clear on what your partner's relationship with money is, you could be walking around in the dark which leads to a major, major issue in the relationship. Well, what happens when you're walking around in the dark? You get scared. And what happens when you get scared? You look for things to comfort you. How do you do that? You start spending money. Yeah. Uh, and, and, And this is... What allows you to feel good as one person's taking control of the situation, you're in the dark because you don't want to discuss it. You got to feel better. You're spending money on whatever escapism and and, uh, vices that will allow you to uh, to comfort food, junk food in that moment to allow you to feel good. So we now understand the pitfalls around not understanding our own relationship with money or our partner's relationship with money. So how do we get to a place where we can work this out. Obviously, it's an important part of a relationship, feeling comfortable with money and your partner's relationship with money does create a lot of security. It does create a lot of freedom. So how do we get there? Now, Olivia Mellon, who's a therapist specializing in money conflicts among couples for the last four decades, says that if opposites don't attract right off the bat, then they will create each other eventually. So that polarization is going to happen. How do we handle it? First, she says that each partner should tell the other about their view on money. As we said at the start, we all have our own belief system around money. What is your story? And again, in a relationship, we should feel comfortable enough to have this conversation. Some of us listening are like, AJ, Johnny, I don't feel comfortable enough. Well, it's the first thing that came to my mind is how many other difficult conversations have you had to get what you wanted and now, the, but you don't want to have this one, right? I don't know why I'm laughing because I'm thinking about all the kinky talks you've had. So you're getting yours in the bedroom, but yeah, you don't want to talk about money. No, we don't <laughs> want to talk about the checkbook. <laughs> Next, it's time for each one in the relationship to mention their concerns about the other's relationship to money and explain why this is a concern. Now, this is important. We want to follow up with what you like about their relationship and maybe what you envy them for. So for example, what might be stressful for you is the fact that your partner is an extreme saver and penny pincher and wants that security. Now saying this is something for me that is concerning. Here's why, but also saying, Hey, and I actually kind of envy you for this. I wish I could be a better saver. I wish I had that relationship with money. Yep. The last step is actually agreeing on how you're going to handle this as a couple. And that's really key. I've met couples that have agreed that separate bank accounts are the way to go. Sure. I've met couples that have agreed that a prenuptial agreement is the only way to feel safe and secure in their relationship. And then I've met couples who are joint everything. Everything's pulled together and that's the rule. Well, and... And not one of those are better than the other. It just works. You want the one that works best for you and your relationship. Exactly. And that means being honest. And don't get us wrong. This is not an easy feat to pull off. In fact, I was going through the prep uh, for the show with Amy and we were talking about, hey, these are conversations that we have had to a degree, but we'd like to have more of and like to get a greater understanding And, and understanding that when this conversation is had and it's ongoing, you can start to create goals for mm-hmm. the relationship that you could work towards. Well, and that's going to roll into part three, which which is growing. I mean, we understand how important those goals are for ourselves. And if we're taking an I and we're turning it into a we, well, then why wouldn't that be good for you? Because you're now not two separate people. You're a relationship. You are one. So obviously we've been discussing the earlier parts of a relationship. First, just committing to a relationship 
and then, you know, moving in together and potentially talking about the first conflict, which is money. Now, we want to talk about what happens when you start to feel that you are growing apart. Again, the rose-colored glasses for everyone are, oh, this thing's going to keep moving in the same direction at the same speed. Yeah. That's not how, <laughs> how we as humans grow in relationships. Well, and I want to put up, I'm going to try to put a picture together for everyone. And I want you to think of some sort of X and it doesn't need to be a perfect X, just two lines that are intersecting at some point. You can look at those as trajectories of your life and another person's. And at some point, those two trajectories met and you met that person. It doesn't mean that now that you've met that person, you started dating that those trajectories just align into just, one. Just, just in line. They are still going in their directions unless one or both people decide to course correct. Now, let's say that you decided that doesn't mean that the other person is now straightening out. That's why this conversation needs to be taking place. So growing apart is going is, and you should not look at it as this relationship is coming to an end or this relationship is failing. This is there is some work that needs to be done in order to get both parties back on the same path here. And, at least a greater understanding of what the path is. Yes. I think a lot of us go into relationships not really thinking about the 5, 10, 15 year plan, right? We're so happy the chemistry is there and we finally found that person that gets us and allows us to feel safe and secure. So why am I going to worry about what's going down 5, 10 years from now? But guess what? Especially those of us who are younger, I hate to go there, Johnny. <laughs> In our younger years, we're going to be growing and changing a lot. Yes. You know, I look back at the person I was in my 20s and who I was dating then and now the relationship I'm in with Amy and I am a different person. Mm -hmm. I do have different worldviews. I have experienced more living on both coasts, growing up in the Midwest. Now, understanding that, okay, with this growth is going to come moments and times in your relationship where you feel like you're moving apart, where you feel like maybe things are drifting in opposite directions and this could happen months from now or years from now but it is inevitable yes that's that is what we're trying to say here it is inevitable there's there's no relationship in the world that does not go through this in fact if the relationship isn't uh, I, that's where i would start putting up alarms that's red flags that's, right. there's something odd there because as i said there's two people they be, each have a trajectory. It's an unhealthy relationship. Yes. There's probably some severe codependency going on there if it feels like those trajectories have just stayed in alignment. Now, we have to move on from this Hollywood concept of romance and relationships. We're just, once you find that one, everything <laughs> works out, all the boxes are checked, and it's smooth sailing. There's going to be rough seas. After. How do you captain that ship in rough seas? And Dr. Christine Menke author of the book, Everybody Marries the Wrong Person, suggests a different way of thinking about this. What a title. I know. <laughs> That's great. When you find yourself focusing on what isn't so great about your loved one, you actually need to shift your focus. What does this mean? Well, instead of asking what's wrong with the other person, ask yourself, why am I suddenly so discontent? And what do I need to do? So it's not about, look at the guy across the table from me, look yeah. at the girl across the table from me and all their issues. It's actually, oh, I gotta put a mirror up and figure out what's going on with me first. Always. Because in the early stages of a relationship, of course your partner's gonna contribute a lot to your happiness. Mm -hmm. That's probably why you agreed to get in a relationship in the first place. But you cannot rely on them to provide happiness for you forever. That's just not realistic. And we also can't blame them for not supplying it for us anymore. Well, once again, we're coming back to the idea of self-development. And a lot of that is understanding your responsibility of your own emotions and well-being. If you haven't done that, well, of course you're going to go into a relationship and putting that on the other person. And then looking at them sometime and going, I'm not happy here. And it's all your fault. I... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> what what you're doing is you are simply requiring the other person to change. Yep. And 
that's a non-starter. It, the only way that change is going to happen is if you're leading your own change. It's not going to come from you telling the other person, even in an ultimatum, that if this change doesn't happen, I'm out. Change happens when you're leading the change in yourself. And William Doherty, professor of psychology and head of the marriage and family therapy program at the University of Minnesota, makes a good point on how we can shift our thought process. Typically, what we're thinking is, I deserve someone who has all the same interests as me. Why doesn't my partner want to do this? What you're doing here is requiring the other person to actually act out of their character. Mm -hmm. By requiring them to be a carbon copy of you and have everything that you like as well, you're not allowing them to be who they are. So instead, we need to reframe this. And the easiest way to do this is to say, I wish my partner would go out with me more. Now you actually have something to work with. You can actually ask yourself, how do I need to change in order to make this happen or to live with it? Think about that. How do I need to change in order to make it happen so that my wish from my partner actually comes true? And instead of trying to pull your partner over to your side, see if you could find the common ground and find something that they actually like. You know, a lot of times, this is coming from a communication breakdown. And these communication breakdowns typically lead to blow up arguments and then resentment building. And ultimately, your wishes and your interests are emotional bids. You're trying yes. to connect. You're trying to get the other person to connect with you. And there are going to be times where your partner turns away from those emotional bids, doesn't recognize them, doesn't want to participate in those likes and interests. And instead of blaming them, and casting aspersions on them and forcing them to change, or instead of moping around about the fact that they're not changing, see if you can compromise. See if you can find something that they actually enjoy and go after that instead of looking at it from such a selfish perspective. And just that simple act and effort of participating in what they like and trying to find ways to please their wishes often opens the door to that movement together. Well, we always say it's the strongest frame dissolves the weaker one. And so upon you leading and, and doing it your way, th th you would, it's in hopes that this person is going to take after, see the, take appreciation for what you're doing for this relationship, which is going to have them step up their game. But the other thing is we have to also remember if you're listening to the show, you're in the self-development and you understand that change is difficult and you're willing to put yourself in difficult situations because change is important, doesn't mean everyone else is. And that's, that's a very difficult. And by you, the, and, the, and I said this on a, on a previous show, the, one of the things that frustrates me most is when I'm forced into situations that I'm not versed in what I'm forced into the unknown. I don't mind going into the unknown willingly. So I, I'm prepared. I'm ready to go. I'm open to what's about to happen. And there is, I always say this saying of I'm able to flip certain switches that allow this to be possible. And that, but when I'm forced into those situations, it, it's, I have to stop myself from, from protecting myself and shutting down. And that is a difficult thing. And then, so when you're expecting and forcing somebody else to follow you or to make these changes or to entertain you in these, in these, in this manner, and then wonder why there's being so difficult about it is because they're, you're forcing them into the unknown. They're shutting down. Yeah. And I, I lived at the opposite side. So, you know, when I met Amy, she mentioned that health and fitness was a very important factor mm -hmm. in her relationship and and what she was looking for in a partner. And of course, in the honeymoon phase, it was hikes and yeah, I, I'm active too. But, you know, business life gets in the way. And, and as we've talked about on the show, we really hadn't been physically active. We'd been working out, but not nearly to the level that we have been with a trainer. Yeah. And, 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 and it's... <laughs> Amy's not like, hey, I've been to the gym twice this week. It's <laughs> it's definitely it's an important that, part of her life. Of it's course. A, it's a very strong value. In yeah. fact, just this morning, she was talking about how difficult it has been with all the travel and not working out yeah. and the toll it's taken on her. Yeah. So obviously, Amy wanted me to work out with her. Of course. She sees the importance of it. She values it. And 
Bless her heart, she was patient enough with me and tried different activities with me. So, you know, I didn't agree and enjoy to go to Barry's originally. I was like, no, I'm not interested in Barry's. And she tried to get me to go and finally I took it and I didn't like it. And she wasn't then despondent or angry with me. She was like, okay, well, let's find something else that you will enjoy because I think exercise is important. I'm willing to try and take a class that maybe I'm not going to enjoy. And trust me, we signed up for class pass and we took a lot of classes that either one of us enjoyed. And then I started to get more comfortable in classes. I started to feel like this is pretty fun. And then I was like, hey, let's check out that Barry's boot camp again. And what do you know? Different instructor allowed me to get more in my comfort zone. And it actually clicked with me. Yeah. When we think about this, right, this is the teamwork that goes on in a relationship. When, when you actually care about someone else and you feel like your needs and values are maybe not being met, the caring side of you is like, well, let's figure this out. Let's let's get to a place where we can find some fun and find some enjoyment and find some fulfillment and, and being patient in that. I think so many people, and, and I'm just as at fault, are quick to judge, quick to write people off. And if you don't get that immediate satisfaction, right? We live in the instant yeah. gratification world. And it, and it, it, it transfers in every area of our lives. Yeah. And it could have been very easy for Amy to be like, you know what? Screw this. You're not working out. I told you this is important to me. But again, a teamwork partnership based relationship is all right. Well, let's figure out some other ways that we can get this working. And that point of taking a step back and realizing that it's not just about the other person. It's about us. Mm -hmm. Now, when we learn to recognize our needs, we have to speak up. I know for me personally that I've struggled with communication. It's something that I've obviously dedicated my life to at this point, coaching, Mm -hmm. communication, conversations, how to have difficult conversations, being introverted, having a dad who raised me, who was also pretty introverted and conflict averse. I didn't have the tools to deal with this. And I've been in other relationships where they're like, you are a poor communicator. What is this about? Why are you not telling me what you want, what your needs are? And I've had to work on this myself and understanding that when you can communicate your needs effectively and also listen to your partner's needs effectively, you can create a sustainable relationship. But when those needs are unmet, well, we're going to have difficulties. If you can't communicate your needs, well, that's going to lead to even more difficulties. So understanding that when relationships are growing apart, it's in large part due to the fact that we're not meeting each other's needs and we're now starting to feel a little lonely, a little distant in this relationship. You know, everyone has to deal with the, the daily grind and everyone deals with it in different ways, obviously. And the, the escapism that you choose could be different than your partners. And you would hopefully be able to combine those. Okay. Oh, you like movies. I guess I could go to the movies more. And now we got movies together, but there still needs to be some escapism of out of the relationship as well. That's, that's very important. And you want to make sure that it doesn't, whatever that escapism is, doesn't spoil over into the relationship. So like, for instance, if your escapism is drinking, well, it's not just drinking because then there's a hangover and then there's a higher feeling afterwards. And now it's taking its toll into the relationship. And these are very important. This also plays a role going back into money because if your escapism gets so expensive, then we have, we have a, a, have a problem there. And, and those things need to be discussed. But escapism is the norm for everyone. Everyone has their things that they enjoy, their hobbies, the things that allow them to play as adults. And everyone needs to be open to those and cast no judge. Everyone gets off on different things, but at the same time, be respectful if those, if that escapism, those hobbies are bleeding into the relationship. Absolutely. Now, how do we become that we? How do we get that teamwork? And most of us, especially our, the younger audience, have lived the majority of our life in a self-centered place. <laughs> yeah. This is what I want. How do I get it? I need this. How do I get it? And in a relationship, 
it's different. It's not about what you want, how do you get it? It's what's best for the team, what's best for us as a team, the we mindset. And we want to end with this very illuminating study on relationships done at UCLA here locally, published in the Journal of Family Psychology in 2012. Justin Lavner and Thomas Bradbury followed 136 newly married couples for 10 years. And as you might expect, all of them reported high levels of satisfaction at the start. And even four years later, here's where it gets interesting. Between the couples that stayed together for those 10 years and those that divorced, Lavner and Bradbury found only two elements differed. The first one was negative and protective self-talk when there were difficulties in the relationship. And the second one was non-supportive reactions when one partner was discussing a personal issue. They concluded that negative skills and emotions exchanged during problem solving and socially supportive conversations are a leading explanation for this effect, whereas the commitment to the relationship failed to distinguish between intact and dissolving couples. So your commitment at the start is meaningless. How you handle the negative and conflict in the relationship is really what it's about because conflict is inevitable. If you're negative and you are using protective self-talk, meaning digging in your heels, unwilling to accept any blame or criticism, throwing it back at the other person when there's difficulties in the relationship, you could imagine that this would lead to some strife. Now, if you're also non-supportive when the other person is sharing their needs and wants, you again could imagine how this builds resentment. You know, I was laughing about this. When, what would you say would be a, your guesstimate of the average first fight in a relationship? Three months in? These days, I feel like <laughs> everything's moving at light speed. So yeah. probably within a month. Yeah. Well, the, you, uh, my point being that, you know, if it, if, if it's, if it hasn't happened for a while and you're a few months in, you've already invested so much and what you might see in that conflict might scare you of moving forward, but you've already invested too much in. So you're like, all right, well, I didn't like what I saw there, but let's just hope that's just the one time. And if it's at the, if it happens rather quick, you're like, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> and that's important because all of us, we, it's hard not to look at a relationship as a, like a, a bad gambler because of the time and effort that you put in, you don't want it to be wasted, but you have to accept that you are wasting time with this person and hope it for the best for learning to be better. Um, because, because it is time that you're not getting back. I would say absolutely right on the head when it comes to relationships, it is an investment. Yeah. And you have to be willing in that investment to lose sometimes. And, and that's going back to the, the very first concept we talked about today, when to know to go into a committed relationship or not. It is an investment. And some of these investments of time and energy in a relationship, guess what? Aren't going to work out. They're going to end up in breakups. So in the end, long-term relationships are about adapting and adjusting to each other. In order to do that, you have to start with yourself first. Because it's impossible to adapt and adjust to someone else, even though toxic people might try. So we talk a lot about leading from the seat that you're in. When you're feeling this discontent, when you're feeling that things are drifting apart, it is not the moment to cast blame. It's the moment to be self-reflective and see if there are actions and conversations you can have to move closer to the middle. Because all you're going to do by throwing complaints and airing of grievances to the other person in these moments of drifting apart is actually build more resentment. And that's the last thing you want if you're looking to save that relationship. Now, this wraps up our navigating romance for this week. Before we let you head off, though, we have a question for you. What are you struggling with the most in romantic relationships? As always, our last episode this month is going to be a Q&A episode where we answer your questions. Let us know. You can always find us on social media, and we're always excited to hear from you. You can send your thoughts by heading on over to theartofcharm.com slash questions. You can email us, questions at theartofcharm.com, or hit us up on social, The Art of Charm. We'd also love one other favor. 
If you could head on over to your favorite podcast app and leave a review, we would thoroughly enjoy it. It helps people find the show. Thank you for all of your support. Until next week, have a good one. See you later.